any nationality, but particularly Israel, because they have been known to deal with um, a lot of anti-Semitism, and we see even anti-Semitism is rising again. Um, yeah, so that's the weak. That's their weakness. What's the weakness of the post-millennial? Uh, the weakness of the post-millennial is that, again, partly they can become anti-Semitic because they don't believe um, that Israel has any um, promises yet to be fulfilled, which is, if that's, you know, that's okay if that's how they interpret it and, and all that. Just be careful that you don't move into anti-Semitism. And... Um, What happens with the post-millennials is that uh, they believe that we are going to move into an, a golden age period where, where society will be Christianized. And again, um, if that's not accurate, and time will tell, right, whether it is or not, but if it's not accurate, you need to, you're, you need to prepare your heart to, to accept the fact that maybe the world won't be Christianized. Um, you can still be working at it, but always, you know, watching and praying. Watching and praying, because that's what Jesus told us. The only thing he told us to do, watch and pray. So the dis dispensational pre-mills, their, their weakness is that um, they might want to just escape. Because, you know, they're, they're just going to be raptured out. So, you know, I'm just going to hunker down. I'm going to get some... So, you know, just I, I'm just going to hunker down, forget the future trouble, and um, I'm just going to wait for the rapture. The other weakness of um, the the dispensational pre mills because of their view of being pre raptured out is they're the ones who tend who usually have um, the the misguided views of when the rapture's coming. Like we've heard them many times, right? Like somebody, somebody I was driving with last week told me that she had a friend who believed that they were going to be raptured out in September during the feast of, um, yeah. Okay, so it's these ones, because they don't have a real definite sign of when Jesus will return, they just keep thinking, you know, all, all the signs in Matthew 24, they're just going to get worse and worse and worse, and then finally we're going to be raptured. But they don't really have any clear sign as to when that might happen. And so they tend to give these types of, of um, pre-rapture prophecies or whatever. Okay, so that's just the weakness of that one. Um, the weakness of the historic pre-mills... <laughs> is their overemphasis on the tribulation and on the darkness, okay? They can get very heavy with that and forget about the glory that will come in the midst of that tribulation period. Okay, so I just want to quickly say, what are the signs that each of these views look for? Um, because Jesus said to watch and pray because there's signs. So what are the signs? So the amillennials are looking for a gospel preached in all the world, and the falling away from the faith. So that's what they're keeping their eyes on. And some of them, some of the reformed, they're called reformed all millennials, are looking for a literal antichrist to appear on the scene. Okay? Post-millennials, their only sign is, um, I shouldn't say only, but their sign is for that golden age to come upon the earth when they begin to see the earth being Christianized. So this is what they're looking for. This is what they're waiting for. The dispensational pre-mills, again, I said there's really no sign that they have um, re uh, unless it's just uh, 20, the Matthew 24 sound, signs getting worse and worse. And so then they're just going to expect it. But they don't, we don't know when worse and worse will be, right? And... Um, the historic pre-millennials, now they have more signs um, only because they take prof prophecy literally and um, they believe they're going to they're go through the tribulation. 
So their signs are a mature bride rising, a ten-nation confederacy rising up, um, where the Antichrist will um, rise up with, uh, amongst that ten-nation confederacy. They will see the beginning of a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. They will see Babylon being rebuilt. They are looking for the uh, prophecy of Isaiah 19, that Isaiah 19 highway to unfold. And um, they will believe, they believe in the ab abomination of desolation, who uh, the Antichrist will come and put his image in the temple, in the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. So that's it. Those are the views. Those are the strengths, the weaknesses. And so what do we, what do, we do with, with this again? Just know the weaknesses. Know the weaknesses of each view. And as far as I am concerned, what wisdom would dictate Wisdom would dictate to be prepared. To be prepared, right? Don't assume you're going to be raptured out. Don't, don't assume. So I, I have to just look at his, the historic premillennials and go, you know what? I'm just going to go that route right now because I want to be prepared. And I'm reading scripture and I'm watching and I'm praying. So test everything. Test everything that you are reading and listening to. You know, Paul talked about the false teaching and the false prophets, and I believe many of them will rise up in greater measure in the last days to deceive many. And you know, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11, when we were talking about the false prophets, he called them super apostles, didn't he? He says he's super apostles. What was, G what was he talking about, and what did he want us to get? Just because a super apostle tells you something doesn't mean it's right. We have to move away from this worldly view of looking at people through position, through where they are, where we think they are, whether they're famous, you know, this whole worldly view of that. Because, you know, I can't remember where the scripture is. It says, even if an angel, Paul says it, even if an angel should come and tell you differently, don't believe it. So know what the scripture says. Read Bible prophecy. Know what the, what the prophecy says. Where's that scripture I wanted to read um, that Peter says? Yeah, 2 Peter 1, 18 to 19. We have the word of the prophets made more certain. Old Testament profit, uh, biblical prophecy. And you will do well to pay attention to it, Peter says, as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. We have been given the word of the prophets to know and to understand. So be careful what you read, how you read it. Here, I'm just going to go back to that note. The other thing Paul said um, about the false prophets and teachers is, in, and I know I, I read the verse last night and I forgot to mention it, but the Corinthians thought more highly of these super apostles because they had to pay to hear the message. Now again, it's like be careful that we don't that we're not falling into this worldly system of how we value and esteem um, people and the message and the words. Just because you pay for something doesn't mean it's worth more. You know, it reminds me of, I'll just share this quick little thing because it shows us how our human nature is. But I live on a farm, we have cats, and we get lots of kittens. Wanted to get rid of these kittens. 
So I advertised free kittens. Who wouldn't want a free cat, right? They're free. It's free. No one wanted. No one wanted my kittens. Had cute little pictures posted on them. So then someone told me, charge for them. I go, what? Charge for them. So I put kitten, $10 each. People called me. Do you know why? Do you know what that shows about human nature? It's because we believe that money puts value on something and money calls it something that it's worthful, that it's worthy. Okay. So, doesn't have to be a super apostle who's teaching us. Be careful. Like, you know, Jesus, who did Jesus give his word to? Twelve unlearned men. Twelve unlearned men. So that the beauty of the gift and the weakness of their own nature, that the glory of Christ could be seen in them. And so, oh, Lord, help me here. I'm just... <laughs> Over half the Bible is about end times and about the generation that will see the Lord. And last night, Sandy asked me, if it's so important, why isn't it really clear? Right? And I said, we're not ready for it. We're not ready for the revelation, I don't believe. Because I'm going to tell you, there's two things, two things that I felt the Lord was telling me this morning that, you can, that we can take to the bank, and I believe what he's waiting for. But it's a mature bride walking in love whose only desire is to lift high the name of Jesus to the, for him to receive the glory. And the John 17 prayer, Jesus' prayer will be answered of the unity of the bride because he's coming back for that bride, for that one bride. So I want to I want to end with with this of Jesus the lover of our soul the one who died for us the one who will walk with us who will never leave us wrote us a letter He wrote us a letter a beautiful letter at the end of the Bible, his last and final word to us. And he wrote seven letters. And last night, I, I'm going to say this again, last night when Melanie and Todd and I were praying, I saw Jesus walking. He was that one walking through the lampstands. And I heard him say, for all those who are hungry and for all those who want to know, I'm going to open up the letters and give understanding. Don't stay away from the book of Revelation. It's written by the shepherd of our soul. What's really interesting about the book of Revelation of those seven letters is that in each case, every time he writes the letter, he gives himself a name at the top, doesn't he? 
he describes himself as something. And then at the end, he says what he has against them. And then he tells them what to do. The thing is, is that what they need to do relates to who he is and how he described himself. So I believe that there is that desire of the Lord that we would go and know him by those descriptions he gives. So I just want to, um, I just want to close with this about the seven letters and then, and then some of the things that he warned us about, that we can watch over our own heart as we move and as we watch and pray, as we continue walking with the Lord. So in the church of Ephesus, he, um, he said he was glad that they didn't tolerate false apostles or false prophets, but they had lost their first love. And it was a love for Jesus, but also included a love for others. A love for others. And this is part of the John 17 cry of Jesus' prayer to the Father, that we would be one, that the world might know. Above all else, have love for one another. And in the church of Smyrna, he said, don't fear persecution. Church in Pergamum, he said, Balaam and the Nicolaitans' teaching, which was basically Gnosticism, he said, be careful of it. And we see, like last night I talked about how Gnosticism is alive and well. And in the church of Thyatira, he told them that they tolerated Jezebel. And you know, every time I think about that tolerating Jezebel, I, I submit this to you, that, that Ahab tolerated Jezebel. And so what I believe the Lord is saying in there is be careful of an Ahab spirit that will tolerate Jezebel. And the Ahab spirit, spirit was the spirit of comfort. And of not wanting persecution and of not wanting, you know, just, just it, it, was a, it was a thing of satisfying their own physical desires. And so Jezebel was tolerated and allowed. The church in Sardis, it said he grie they were grieving and quenching the spirit. So there was works done in the flesh and not by the spirit. The church in Philadelphia, he just continued to say, there is an open door given to you. Your reward is coming. And in the church in Laodicea, he said that they were lukewarm. They thought they were rich. And so I just believe he's, he's saying, beware of the love of money. And so the shepherd of our soul in these letters were giving us warnings, giving us advice, giving us direction on how to watch over our soul as the days progress. And as we move into um, the days ahead and however things will unfold, I believe that there will be the message again of John the Baptist, right? The message that Christ is returning, Christ is coming, and John the Baptist said, prepare. And so I believe our message is a message that Christ is coming, but he's coming as the king. And so I believe the message will be the message of the coming king. So I think, I think I'm going to end this part here. Um, I know there's a question and answer period at 2.30 if anybody wants to come and talk a little bit more about this. Um, so I think I'm just going to close, and I don't know, I'm not sure what time it is. Quarter to 12. So Lord, um, I'm going to just bow our hearts and bow, 
bow before you, Lord. I know there was much that was said here, a lot of information. And Lord, it comes from, from people who want to know and who want to follow you. I pray, Lord, that we would not just become followers, but that we would become people who take what we hear and study it and know it. Because, you know, someone can bring something and it sounds right until someone else brings another view. So, Lord, we need to become students of you. I thank you for the views, Lord. I thank you that it gives us a beginning of a framework to begin to know and to understand. And Lord, I pray most of all that none of us will hold tightly to any view. That we will not become a Pharisee and, and even like the Pharisees in your day who missed their visitation. Lord, I pray for a release of a love for the book of Revelation. I pray a release of love. I pray that you woo us to that book. Jesus, the lover of our soul, the one who loved John. John was the most beloved of the disciples, and Jesus came to him. He said, write this down, John so that they can know. So, Lord, we say um, there's no fear in you. There's no fear in the days ahead. And, uh, Lord, I know where there could be fear and where there has been fear even in my own heart. You know how to speak to me. You know how to speak to each one of us. Because you're not a God of fear. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I want to just wait on him for a minute. I just feel like... 